Today we want to conclude with was Samson a man of God or a man after the flesh? As we left off the last time, we only came to one logical conclusion, and that was that Samson was called, but that the people around him did not understand Samson's methods or what methods Samson was incorporating. Was Samson utilizing a tactic to immense himself or to immerse himself into Philistine culture to learn more about the Philistines? Rule number one in war is to know thy enemy. But what, what better way to learn your enemy than to marry one? Because when you do that, you learn their customs, you learn the language, you learn the inner workings of your enemy. So lesson number one, <laughs> this is a lesson that Samson learned the hard way. Don't trust anyone with your secrets, your tactics, especially don't share um, how to disarm your secret weapon, which God had endowed you with to win the victory over your enemies. Now, Samson's secret weapon, obviously, was his strength. And behind his strength, it was God. But his strength was vital to him defeating the enemy. I mean, this lesson was reinforced with his first wife. I know many of you all know the story, but we'll get there in a second. This type of incident would have made an impression on one's personal or long-term memory this is, a, this is an incident that you would never forget. His first wife betrayed his trust with a secret that he had entrusted to her. <clears throat> so his life was later given in marriage to another man. His wife and in-laws were eventually burned to death by those same Philistine rulers. Now this type of event imprints on one's psyche the consequences of one's actions. How many of you all would have forgotten a situation like this? Now, let's talk about collateral damage. Samson had already alienated himself from his people to protect his people. Let me say that again. Samson had alienated himself from his people to protect his people. Now, that, that was a smart military move at that time. Actually, it's a smart move any time. Why was it smart? Because now that there was, there was no point in the Philistines providing retribution to his people because his people didn't like him. This alienation, I believe, was intentionally done to prevent revenge from being taken against his people because in the mind of the Philistines, <laughs> Samson was a lone wolf. He was a renegade, an embarrassment uh, to his people as evidenced by his people actually turning him over to the Philistines. It further showed that his people were not in cahoots with him. Now, Samson then went on to kill thousands of the Philistines. Samson was now public enemy number one. Now, Samson had over the years become very familiar with the inner workings of the Philistine government, with their holy days, their customs, how they treated prisoners, and more importantly, how they treated prisoners of special interest. These were prisoners that they could uh, give sacrifice to their god Dagon and <laughs> For their God, Dagon, you want to give him something special, something priceless, something, I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So a prisoner's uh, special interests were placed on display during the annual festival of Dagon. Now, at this celebration, all of the influential uh, people, the politicians, the lawmakers, the head of military, the head financial people, anyone with a position of power would not miss this festival. So over the years, Samson, okay, Samson had known prostitutes who would have been familiar with these types of people and intimate details about the who's who of society. I mean, you, you hear it all the time, even now in our day and age, with our sophistication, sophisticated society and everything like that, uh, and our and how we have so much self-control. But we have politicians sometimes that reveal secrets to prostitutes. I mean, but at this time. Prostitution was a legal profession. Um, now, many, many early biblical characters utilized their much needed services. Now, this would provide invaluable recon about the inner workings of the Philistine government. After almost two decades of winning battles here and there against the Philistine without winning the war, Samson needed a way in. Samson needed Delilah. 
I believe that the Lord placed on Samson's heart to love De loved Delilah or like Delilah. Uh, however it worked, um, Delilah, contrary to popular belief, Delilah was no spring chicken and was much older than Samson. And in prostitute years, she would have been all used up or burnt out, as they say. But Delilah was a woman known about town and known of the lords and politicians, the Philistines. She would have been, since she was much older, she would have been more of a, a leader, uh, a go-to person for young, prost, young, beautiful, sensual, sexual prostitutes coming up who needed guidance as far as uh, their career and things like that. Delilah would have been someone that they would go to. When I was in the Pacific, they called these people Mama-san. Now, Mama-san, if you were to go into a massage parlor, uh, you could, the Mama-san would be significantly older, but she would have all these younger women, 18, 19, 20, early 20s, and she would clap her hand, and about 20 of these women would come out, and people could pick whichever one of these women they wanted to have sex with. Now, Delilah was something like a mama son. So to say that Samson fell at these portrayals of Samson falling in love with this beautiful woman, that's just not true. Now, she had a reputation. She had an obligation to her people and to the safety of her family. After knowing what happened to Samson's first wife and to his first wife's family, that she would do whatever it took to save her people and her family. Now, although Samson loved Delilah, he knew she was not to be trusted from the unforgettable incident that happened with his first wife. And also from the first two times he told Delilah a lie to see what she would do. And she did not disappoint. She did exactly what he thought she would do. She told the Philistines who were each time waiting outside and they came in. And and so she betrayed him the first two times he told her of his strength, where his strength came from. But Samson knew that the time had finally come. Uh, I believe Samson had finally um, received the courage uh, to accept his fate. Just like Jesus on the cross, he said, not my will, but thy will. When he wanted this, Jesus did not want to die. Jesus asked God, uh, can you uh, find out another, can you, is there another way that you can get this mission accomplished without going this route? He begged. God not to. He cried to God. He sweated blood because he was stressed. Jesus did not want to do it, but he went on and did not his will, but the will of God. Samson, the same thing here. Samson did not do his will, but he was about to do the will of God. But to win the war, Samson knew that it was going to cost him his life. He knew more than anyone else that he would be the biggest attraction, the biggest sacrifice, the biggest reward to the Philistine god Dagon. <clears throat> so it was now time for Samson to relinquish his power and be captured in, and in prison to wait for the celebration of Dagon. And just like that, Samson told Delilah where his strength came from. Samson was no dummies. Sa Samson was almost 50 years old by this time. He had ruled, he had ruled uh, the Israelites. He was a judge for 20 years. So he had not only grown and had strength, but he had wisdom by this time. But it was his time. And, and at that time, you know, 50 years old uh, was kind of, was really kind of old. Now, as expected, she betrayed him and he was captured humiliated and maybe unexpectedly had his eyes gouged out. I don't know if he anticipated that, but contrary to popular belief, <clears throat> having one's eyes gouged out is not the most painful thing that, that can happen. Actually, people say it wasn't that painful at all. There was this young lady who took the, um, the Bible verse um, uh, too seriously in Matthew, Matthew uh, 529, where it says, if, if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If your eyes offend thee, gouge it out. It was a young lady here in the United States who did that uh, because she was uh, suffering with lust. And actually, they, they interviewed her some time later. She's obviously blind, and she says she has a much better life. But that's neither here or now. That's not relevant to what we're talking about. But he had his eyes gouged out. Um, <clears throat> he was in prison. Um, uh, 
Samson was imprisoned with instruction. The guards were given instructions not to kill him because Samson was to be the biggest spectacle at the event. Yeah. Whew. Samson's strength was gone, but he knew God was not gone because he still had not fulfilled his mission. Now, many of us today can take comfort in knowing that God will keep you here until you accomplish what you were meant to accomplish. You might be here five years. You might be here a day. You might be here a hundred years, but you might be uh, an alcoholic, a drug addict, abused, but you can be certain of that your situation is playing into a bigger purpose, which might not be a uh, which might not always be pleasant for you, but what's bad happening to you is doing something good for the many. And you can catch one of my sermons uh, that talk about the blueprint of God, on how God is lives in the now. With God, there is no past, present, or future. There's only now. So when people, uh, when ministers talk about God doesn't change, you know, he wrote this law 2,000 years ago, and we can't change the laws today. That's nonsense, because actually it was all laid out at one time, like a scroll that was just dropped on the table and laid out. Everything from beginning to end is there. But anyway, catch that sermon. But back to Samson. He must just wait for the opportunity to complete his mission because he knew he couldn't die because he, he hadn't fulfilled what God had told him he was going to fulfill. So when the time finally came, Samson knew exactly where he wanted to be placed in the temple because he had seen it. He had seen the temple many times before. He had seen the ceremonies done every year many times before. So Samson knew his strength did not lie only in his hair, but in the power of God. So Samson called to God one last time. Samson called, said, give me strength. One last time, he answered to God. And God obliged him. And Samson completed the mission for which he was born. He was only born for one purpose. And all that he had sex with process, if that's okay. But if you think about it, the Bible only mentions a couple of people he had sex with. But if you think about it, and, and that was in 50, over the course of 50 years. He didn't even have sex with his first wife because they, they had not consummated the marriage yet. But that's a whole nother story. But like Jesus, Samson welcomed death because for him, it would be finished. Now, whether Samson accomplished his mission out of revenge for his eyes or the salvation of his people, he accomplished his end goal the dissolution of the Philistine government, so in effect creating freedom for the children of Israel. Samson completed his Nazarite vow. Now, when people who are familiar with the Nazarite vow, Jesus was a Nazarite. The vow usually concludes with a sacrifice. You do boom, 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 boom. You do, 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 do. You finish your mission. There's a sacrifice. That's usually what happens, and that's part of the Nazarite vow. So Samson sacrificed himself. What Samson did to the Philistines would be equivalent to someone eliminating the House of the, the Senate, our House of Representatives, the President, all our courts, uh, and the whole White House of the United States. Imagine someone wiping all that out. I know there's a TV show uh, on TV. I, I can't think of the name that talks about everyone being white, uh, designated survivor uh, with Michael Keaton, I think it is. But imagine all of the government being wiped out, not even one undesignated survivor living. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he killed during his lifetime. After this event, the Israelites were liberated from the Philistines and there was peace in Israel for 46 years after, the, after Samson's death. Like many before and after him, uh, received his share in the spiritual gift of eternal life. Now, we'll talk about that later when I talk about universal salvation and things like that, the plans of God. Um, in Hebrews 11, Samson is mentioned in the hall of faith along with Rahab the harlot. So a harlot made it to eternal life and Samson, who people said was this, as I said in part one, was this big, bulky, conceited, arrogant, self-centered muscle man only out for sexual gratific self gratification, which was <laughs> is not true. But most ministers today will tell you that. 
That's why here at Common Sense Ministry, we give you the truth. No matter how pretty, no matter what your grandmama told you, no matter what your pastor told you, we give you the truth. So how does this apply to us today? Jesus only had one purpose. Yeah, he healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He, he, he did all these things along the way. But that was not his purpose. Those were distract. Not I don't want to say distraction, but that was not his main purpose. Those were just other things that were done on the side. But Solomon had one purpose, you know, to build a temple uh, for God. Apostle Paul had one purpose, and that was to, to preach the gospel to the, the Gentile. Samson only had one purpose, and that was the liberation of the Israelites underneath the Philistine rule, and he did that. So all this other stuff he did in between is just commentary. It does not matter. Who cares? So we are, just remember this, we are all here for a purpose. So the number one thing in your life is it's going to probably happen whether you want it to or not, but it'd be better to realize what is your purpose in this life so that you can at least align yourself with that. So what is your purpose in this life, no matter how glorious or inglorious that purpose might be? No matter what part in life you are, what stage in life you are, what you went through or what you're going through, it's all part of a master plan, the great scheme of things, as, you, as they would say. I like this quote by Horace Mann, who I share the name with, one of the early uh, 17th, 18th century economists. He said, you should be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humankind. And that's my motto. I will be ashamed to die unless I have done something significant for mankind. Have a good day.